everyone, welcome to Lens Interview Series. Today we have a super fun topic. We're gonna we're talking about how to build a record breaking campaign with Envision's head of global events. I'm Chris Carver, Lens co-founder and CEO. And before I begin, I just you know, I have to give a shout out to our product team for creating this virtual event platform and webinar platform that we're using today. We're just uh, super excited about the potential of a platform like this for interviews and webinars and roundtables and fundraising events, conferences. Really, we built it for, you know, to support your entire event portfolio. So um, if you're interested in trying it out, I have to give the shameless plug, but, you know, feel free to go to our website. You can sign up for free and test out the platform. So would love, love your feedback for sure. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you notice on the right hand side um, by where the chat is, feel free to you know, put any questions in there. I think that would be really helpful. You can also click on uh, people and you can see there's a little green dot of you know, who's actually live in here. Um, but one of my requests would be if you don't mind filling out some of the polling questions we have, you, you'll be able to see the answers instantly and it would just be really helpful for us to continue to learn from you, you all as well. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to introduce my partners for today's interview. Um, I have Erin Chesterton. She's uh, our or Lens Marketing Manager. And our guest for today, uh, which I'm really excited about, is Lisa Day, uh, Head of Global Event Marketing at Envision. Uh, welcome, Lisa. Hey, thank you for having me. Excited. Yeah. Yeah, this will be fun. Um, I've we've known each other for quite some time, so yeah, this is our. <laughs> um, but the goal for the interview today is to really give give folks who are attending and and you know really people the tips and tactics you need to map out a successful campaign from end to end. So it's definitely a little meaty, but I think that's what you know we all want. We all want to learn how to be better marketers. Uh, how to you know more incorporate events into all of that that experience. So I'm really excited for this personally because we have a lot of the same problems that the folks attending have today. Um, so, Aaron, I, I know you had a couple things you wanted to get uh, get started with before we before we get going. Yeah. So at the end of the session today, we'll be sharing with everyone a campaign planning bundle. So you'll have a campaign brief template, the tips, the weekly to do's that you need to be successful from pre-event during your launch and post launch. So stay tuned at the end and I'll send that into the chat um, and really just taking everything that Lisa's sharing with us today, making it tangible so that you can apply it to your strategy. Awesome. And Lisa, before we get going, do you mind giving a little background or overview of Envision, what you do, interesting stats, anything that would you know provide context here? Yeah, sure. So um, Envision is an inclusive collaboration platform for innovative customer ex experiences. Um, we have 7 million users, um, including 100 of the Fortune 100 organizations, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so between our platform and our practices, our people and community, uh, we enable tens of thousands of organizations to improve their processes and workflow so that they can create the world's best digital product. So I guess you could say we're in the digital digi digital product design field. Cool. And, and I'm going to start off with a pretty big, broad question, but <laughs> can you walk me through your, your campaign planning process? Because you guys do a ton. Yeah. And I know this is where I really wanted to get going. Yeah, that is a big question. And so um, I think it's apparent, but I fall into the marketing organization at Envision. We have other teams as well. We have our product team, operations, sales. So lots of different organizations within the Envision umbrella. And I fall within marketing. So I guess to take a step back, like planning and goals should always ladder up to your organizational goals or your organization's goals and in initiatives and objectives. So it starts with your org goals and then it funnels into your department and then finally your team. And I really can't em emphasize how important it is for each in individual on your team to understand wh why their work is important, why they're doing it and how it's impacting the organization as a whole. So uh, for any leaders that are joining, transparency is so key. Um, it's in so important for your team, um, your department heads and other co-leaders to be aligned. Um, so kind of to jump into my planning process, which I'm going to use events as an example. 
um, is it starts here. So I'm aligned on my department goals and projections and objectives and what we're trying to achieve in quarter or in year or in the half year, depending on how you your goals are set up. Um, so I'll, I'll share some tips on where to begin. Um, so a planning meeting or a session um, is a great place to start. And that is a moment where you're able to collaborate with your teams to draft, uh, in the case of events, a calendar, uh, doesn't always have to be that, for your campaign that aligns with your product goals and objectives. So it could be your product launches, your sales goals, any content releases, really creating like an integrated marketing calendar. So for me, I start out, I like to start with a blank canvas, just like when I'm like cleaning out my closet, like I like to take all the clothes out and throw them on the bed and like start fresh. <laughs> um, so a blank canvas in this case would be um, a calendar, right? We use calendars to plan events. So the first thing I do is I start with this blank calendar and then I go through and populate that calendar with no show days. So days that like are off limits for any sort of um, campaign, event, programming. Um, so the way I do that is I look at holidays, super easy. If you're doing, if you have your Google calendar, you can subscribe to holidays, um, personal vacation days on the team or any days that we have like a big company, all hands conference or a revenue kickoff, try to avoid those days. And then I also look into like our competitors and any industry conferences that are taking place that may draw our attendees and create competition. So once I go through that process and do all of the vetting, um, for in-person back in the day, we'd also then start vetting venues um, and venue availability, which is a little different in, in a virtual age at this moment. Um, but once I get to that point, we're left with a few select days per week and per month that are available, right? Like, especially when we're looking in like holiday season. So I, personally, I, I like to avoid Mondays and Fridays, especially with virtual events. That's where we see the highest attrition rates and interest ratings. Um, so once I'm down to these select days, I'm able to start seeing like a nice cadence of programming availability based on that criteria I mentioned earlier. So product launches, sales goals, content releases, big email sends that align with um, our cross-functional partners. And then I'm able to kind of start plug and play, like building out this calendar. So I do all of this legwork ahead of like a team meeting and a team planning session. That way, when you get into that meeting, you have something already started to build. Like the framework is kind of there and it's able to be a really like um, tactical working session rather than a brainstorm, which I know we're gonna talk about brainstorms next. Um, but that's like a piece of advice for getting started and being prepared for, for planning. Um, I'm gonna stop there and <laughs> see if you have any questions before I move into like how we think about segmentation. You, well, I think it's really interesting that, okay, so you, you've designated Mondays and Fridays pretty much off limit, mm -hmm. the kind of like, you, you know, how you would designate when to post certain things on social or when you're sending out emails. So you, you have a very narrow window, it seems like, of days. And, and I guess that is in, in normal reality. So it's really cool that you kind of plan that all up front and then start to plug and play yep. going forward. Yeah. And it doesn't always work out perfectly. Like we might have a one-off workshop that takes place on a Friday that makes sense for whoever is facilitating or if it's a longer a longer activity or day. Um, and also any conferences that we're involved with, we have to adapt to their schedule. And, and I may be jumping the gun here, but you did a little over 200 events of some sort last year. And yeah. so mm -hmm. those days, I'm assuming there's crossover on certain days. Yeah, definitely which requires a, a lot of team players. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Fascinating. Well, yeah, thank you. Cool. So I think that just to take planning to the next step is like really like the strategy behind like the why, like what, what are we doing and why, how does this funnel into our goals? So um, that's just like a small piece, right? So there's so much more that happens behind the scenes. So we have like segmentation, targeting and acquisition. So that's how I really think about like my strategy for the programs we're running. So segmentation, let's start with that. Segmentation is really defining which business segments within your organization you're hoping to target. So if you're a brand, if you're a company that with multiple products or offerings and services, this is where you start. What product or service are you hoping to promote or sell through your campaign? So that's segmentation. Um, then next you can move into targeting. So this is identifying your target audience, um, which can break into a multitude of categories. Think like demographics, right? Age, loca location, persona, uh, based on title. The organization size, uh, what industry they're in, 
maybe you have access to what their behaviors look like within your product or service. Uh, there's so many other categories that can fall into targeting. And then finally, uh, there's acquisition. So this is like, how do you get people to show up based on that segmentation and targeting? Are they opted into your database? And if they're not opted into your database, how do you plan on reaching them? We know there's many channels for acquisition, like social and paid, um, in-product messaging, community outreach, co-marketing, sponsorship, that list goes on as well. There are so many, uh, there are so many options and ways to configure the right acquisition strategy. Um, and oftentimes it's a, it's a lot of those things blended together. But Chris, I, <laughs> I'd love to hear your, your comments on this, but I think we all know that email marketing alone just can't do the trick. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I can only imagine you know, an organization like yours with 200 events. And I think about the funnel, you know, you probably have events for top of funnel, you have events for middle of funnel, you have events for bottom of funnel. So I'd be interested to hear, and maybe it's, you don't know off the top, but how, what's the percentage of breakdown? And do you have events that have a crossover, which you may? Definitely. So um, the way my team's kind of broken up is we have um, like our events team oversees like our larger events, which are like we call like one to many. Oftentimes they are top of funnel. Um, but if we are doing like so we have kind of two channels, we have like events and webinars. Events are more top of funnel, um, you know, product trends, um, like thought leadership style. And then we have like webinars, which are more technical. Um, so when we get to that more technical, it, it does become more bottom of funnel, but we can still have a big reach based on our targeting. Um, and then when we talk about more middle of funnel and bottom of funnel related to um, like ABM, like our account based marketing, we have a team that executes events within, you know, our customer base, right? So really like bespoke one to one events that are curated for, you know, a problem that they might be going through to help um, to help provide education and prevent churn. Is that what you, you have like a, a events for your design community? Is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're talking about? Yeah. Got it. Got it. And yeah, so you asked me from a, you know, acquisition standpoint, you know, my feeling is, is obviously email, you can own the list, you own the contacts, but Aaron knows this as well. You, you have to constantly vet what is good and what is bad. And, and so I'd be curious from your, when you think about acquisition, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're leveraging all channels from LinkedIn to social and all of that, but do you have a one that is just tried and true that you, you like to go to more than others, or is it a combination of all of them that have to work together? It's definitely a combination. So for um, the more like technical events, we actually use something called Pendo, um, which is like an in-app messaging um, that our like lifecycle team uses. So uh, our customers are familiar with seeing messaging through Pendo and like Driftbots. Um, and we're able to promote events. So if based on like a behavior that they're having or a product that they're using, um, if there's a webinar that's relevant to that top, that content, like we'll be able to, to communicate with them there. Um, that's a really like easy way, I would say, for to get our customers um, to attend our programs. Um, but really just when it comes to the email marketing, just getting, we, I mean, we have so many different filters we go through and I'm, I like work so closely with our email team. I am not the genius behind the email doors, but um, I work with them across, you know, our targeting and what makes sense and who we've been, you know, who we've been emailing to often uh, just to make sure that we're not getting, you know, opt out and fatiguing our, um, our email database. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to throw us off course, but I really, <laughs> I, I think that, it's really interesting to think about how uh, the event, you know, channel is becoming more and more um, a part of the overall marketing strategy, mm -hmm. and it's just becoming more and more important. Um, so I, I think we're going to talk about that later. Yeah, uh, I definitely am excited to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. So I'm curious, Lisa, from this year of 207 events, what did you learn and what would you change moving forward? Huh, um, kind of a tough one. Uh, definitely learned that uh, you have to roll with the punches and you can't be too hard on yourself if something doesn't work out perfectly. I feel like we're just inventing a lot of new things last year, mm -hmm. like especially at the like beginning of the pandemic, it was like, okay, are we just going to cancel a month of events or like, what are we going to do? So we had to pivot them to, you know, virtual. We actually already had um, a webinar program at Envision um, pre 
pandemic. So we were able to kind of adopt some best practices for virtual events through that program. Um, but yeah, kind of just like be okay with experimenting um, and okay with maybe you run an event and you don't you don't hit your market, your, your, your goals for attendance. And like, that's okay. Just like, I feel like every event that I do, I get sharper on the next one, mm -hmm. um, just based off of small learnings. So after 207, you, you have to have this. Guy. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, so so funny. it's so funny. Cause I, I like oftentimes will like reuse like templates from events that are like similar style and format. And I'll like, look back at like two months ago, Lisa. And I was like, what were you doing? Like this, uh, this is like a totally different language than I'm speaking now. And it just speaks to how quickly things are evolving culturally. Mm -hmm. At that same time though, I think a lot of people lose sight, especially when, you know, the unexpected happens and you're scrambling to respond quickly, but they lose sight in what they already have in front of them and the opportunity they have to take that to the next level. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you host these events, you do spend so much time, energy and effort to get folks there. The event ends. Yes, maybe you send a few follow up emails, but those are still highly qualified leads. There's so much potential to reengage, to nurture. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times the emphasis is put on quantity which right. you know, as a demand gen marketer, I understand that pressure, but yeah. at the end of the day, I will always choose the the quality over quantity. And I think that's something that we'll, we'll continue, continue to see more of over time. Definitely. I, this is something I'm actually thinking about now with our team, because we, we follow up with like a post event email or post, if they download a piece of content, uh, you know, an email, a nurture email as well, um, you know, with, resources, next steps, a hand raiser in most cases. And that happens the day after. And sometimes we do lose interest the day after. They did, they attended the event the day before, the day after they're done. Sometimes we get low open rates and um, we're trying to think about like, should we re-engage with them like a month later? What kind of like sticky, meaningful experiences can we bring up like 30 days mm -hmm. post that, they, that kind of clicks with them? And they're like, oh yeah, I need to go back and check out Envision. Yeah. It's all about just driving value and thinking about new ways to engage and I think you guys are doing a great job with that. So thank you. Well, you don't need 207 events this year to do it. No, no. <laughs> um, so we've walked through your planning process, how you approach brainstorming, um, general timelines and cadence of your events. I'd love to hear a bit more about your briefing process, what you include in a brief, the team members you involve to really take your campaign to that next level um, to go live. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think we could probably elaborate a little bit more on brainstorming if, if we do have time. I just have some yeah, absolutely. like tactical tips on, yeah, on brainstorming. So, all right, briefing. Um, it's kind of another hard question. <laughs> There's so many different types of briefs. So I feel like the audience here today is going to want to know like a campaign, a campaign brief, whether it's for a piece of content um, or an event or, you know, whatever type of campaign they're working on. So, my best piece of advice for a brief is to keep it as clean as possible. Actually, when we were working together on um, this event, you had a really great brief template, not to, um, yes. Just well, thank you, thank that. you. Yes. <laughs> um, but a lot of things that you do are, are, are what I do. So um, I think a really important thing is like naming convention to start. Um, so like making sure like the name of your event matches the name of your website, like that can get people really confused, especially if you have multiple stakeholders or talent. So just having real consistency with like the language that you're using in your brief. So um, always have the official event name or campaign name. I'm sorry, I keep saying events, um, the date and time. Um, and, and be sure that that time is in the right time zone for your audience or any of the external speakers that are there. That's super important. Um, time zones are kind of like my best and worst friend. Um, time zone buddy is like, a tool that I use all the time. Oh, great. Um, yeah, it's a really good one. Um, especially I'm that one down. Yeah, everybody. Like, especially this time of year because time zones change um, pretty frequently. So it's just always something to look at, look out for. Mm -hmm. um, what else do I have? Um, I try to have, if, if you, you might not have this from the beginning, but like a high level agenda or at least a skeleton of how you're thinking about the agenda, whether it's like a five minute introduction, um, you know, a, a presentation piece or a show and tell or a fireside. If you're doing some sort of Q and A section, making sure to like indicate that there will be Q and A, um, and then always allowing time for for closing. Um, 
I also include a description of the event that matches what exists on the landing page um, for the event or piece of content. Uh, a little snippet about the audience is always good. So these briefs are intended to be shared widely. They're in, in, Basically, if anyone from your organization, whether it's your CMO, a sales team member, um, your, your talent, someone from the product team, anyone cross-functionally should be able to look at this brief and be able to understand what you're trying to accomplish. So that's kind of my, my best advice is keep it, um, keep it simple and, and clean and don't make it like a working document. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And these tips will also be shared in the follow-up doc that we share with you all. So um, if you didn't get a chance to catch them all, don't worry. You'll be followed up with. Mm -hmm. um, all so right. I so. didn't mention, sorry, I, I, is, if you're curious about like, how you come to like your, this description and a takeaways for your attendees, um, that's something that I definitely struggle with. And I think a lot of marketers struggle with is like, Here's my work back schedule. I need to have my brief done by this time. And I need to have talent locked in the next week, but I still don't even have a narrative for this mm -hmm. brief. But yeah, I feel like we often find ourselves in this <laughs> pattern. So as early as you can start developing a brief, even if it's before the dates are locked in, like start interviewing people, getting with the subject matter experts, have that brainstorm so that you can really dial in that narrative far in advance ahead of uh, when your deadlines start trickling in for locking in talent and securing all of your marketing uh, materials. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great tip because to mm -hmm. your point, there are so many moving parts um, and you wanna make sure that you are making an informed decision. You're creating content that's compelling for your community, but also speaks to your product in a unique way. Um, and I know we're jumping ahead here, but I think it's might be important to talk about your bad versioning process um, mm -hmm. and how you approach that with your team and what you've learned from that. Because I think that there's some alignment between maybe what you would expect to work as a topic versus your team and how you come together and collaborate. Yeah, and we kind of talked about this like experimentation, right? Like, like we're all testing and experimenting with new concepts, new formats. Um, bad versioning, it, it's so funny because it's like a, it's a bad name, bad versioning. It's actually kind of a cool thing. It's good versioning. So bad versioning and trying new tactics, um, it's actually not a bad thing unless you don't have logic behind it. So um, just go with your gut, like mm -hmm. go with your instincts. As marketers, that's kind of like an uh, like a one thing that's not written on on the job description, right? Is having just like really good intuition and instincts um, based on what you're hearing from your audience. I completely agree. And something, just a little tip for anyone who's trying to get inspiration topically, go to Google search bar, type in the topic and look at the SERP results and frequently ask questions around that. You're going to be super inspired. And I think it's so easy to overthink these topics. But when you just really boil it down to like, who is my target persona? What are they searching? What do they care about? Um, it's you know, yeah. that mixed with, of course, the intuition that we have as marketers. And we so often don't trust that. Um, <laughs> I think that there's just a lot of tools that you can use out there at your disposal. Yeah, definitely. Like the internet is your best friend. <laughs> For sure. Google knows everything. The answers to anything is out there. I swear, a forum, webinar, event, wherever you mm -hmm. need it, it's, it's out there. So um, great. I appreciate you going a little bit more into depth there. Let's hop into measuring success. So we know what you need to brainstorm, how you're approaching the briefing process, collaborating with your team. What are those joint goals that you're mapping out and how do you approach that? Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's like kind of two ways to look at like goals and OKRs, right? So we have things that are super measurable, um, like KPIs. Um, so things in lead and demand gen world are like, you know, Opportunity conversion, ARR opportunities, MQLs, AQLs, um, perhaps like hand raisers, if that's a thing that you do, your attendance rate, your open rates, um, impressions. But so those are some of those like super measurable, quantifiable um, stats. But then there's things that are less measurable um, and that you might not be able to like throw on a graph. But think about things like in attendee exper experience, like did you get your message across to the attendees? Like if you did, that's a win. Um, mm -hmm. And also their engagement. Are they chatting with you throughout the event? Are they engaging with any polls that you're 
you're putting out there? Are you getting like plus ones? Like that's really good. Um, and then also just the relationship building with any anyone who's a part of the program. So that's people that are there live, like your speakers or in your talent. If you have customers attending and it strengthens the relationship, that's another really great, um, a great like key success, um, a key success piece. And then reusability is something I, I've been working on. So making things, making programs run that are like agnostic to date um, mm -hmm. or to a persona and things that can be more broadly used and, and reshared. Um, so that's another big thing. And then yeah, also the, sorry the for coming in quick on mm -hmm. repurposing content because I want people to understand there's just so much opportunity as marketers, especially for someone who might be really strapped with resources. Again, this goes back to less is more focus on the quality over quantity. You can take your virtual event and webinar. If you have a transcript of that, you can create several really compelling blog topics off of that. You yeah. can survey your attendees and then use that data in a fun infographic. So really you can make your events or your campaigns, whatever it may be, go so much further. Um, so I just really want people to understand it's like you're hitting the tip of the iceberg and then there's all that opportunity below to nurture, to really hone in on retention which I think in the B2B space, we don't focus on so much. It's really acquisition, acquisition, but let's mm -hmm. focus on nurture and retention and, and see how that pays off in the long run. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think huh? Chris is going to yeah. pop I'm in next. And again, that's a question he was curious about. I am curious about what the KPIs you're tracking now that you weren't maybe a year ago. Yeah. Are there new stats that you're really starting to you know, hone in? Yeah. Definitely. So um, again, I started at Envision like right before the pandemic started. And, uh, you know, I, I've been doing events for a long time and we definitely had in my previous roles in life, we had, you know, ticket sales, attendance. Those were obviously big KPIs. Um, but yeah, I mean, something I think that is really apparent that we don't give ourselves enough like credit for is like while you're you're losing this like in-person handshake and like have a glass of wine relationship building moment we're actually like getting access to like a high volume audience like we and, and sometimes for free or for a low cost maybe not for free but like you're able to get in front of like hundreds sometimes thousands of people for a really short amount of time and, and have like really dialed in people um like without having to leave your living room. Like, I, I think that's kind of cool and, and a win. It's a weird win, but it's a win. Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead, go for it. I was also gonna say um, with that captive audience, like they're on their computer. So if you're selling like a digital product or even a product that's not digital that you're able to access online, like you have them there, you're able to tell them where to go and where to find it. And they can actually do that in real time while your event is happening rather than, going home after a long night at a dinner and then the next morning, um, you know, being hung over and tired and not doing it, dealing with it till the next week. <laughs> and so this, again, this a uh, little broad question. I, I get the good ones. Um, yeah. Do you have lessons learned on how to your campaigns or your approach to campaigns in the future? <sighs> yeah. I mean, I, we talked about less is more. Um, I think finding ways to make them like really fully integrated with like the rest of like your marketing team. Um, so I work like with our editor, our editorial team who does blog, our blog, um, our team that does podcasts, um, you know, all sorts of different teams. I think just like making your, your campaigns a little bit more like 360 is, is like the way to go and the way to kind of get the most bang for your buck and your time. Um, so less is more trying to create like really smart and intentional campaigns that take time to build, but have a bigger impact. Got it. Got it. Um, and I know we, I know we talked a little bit about this prior, um, but I'm curious if you have any tactics we're concentrating a lot on post-event tactics mm -hmm. do you have any tactics that you really like that are kind of tried and true after each event do you have the same process each time or what does that look like for you yeah it's definitely um an iterative process and depending on like the content and the audience like you know we do our best to be like strategic about the way we get in touch with um our attendees or whoever downloads a piece of content, et cetera. So um, a few things that we do, um, and I'm just uh, gonna 
start from like what we do kind of internally before like externally. So um, we obviously have, you know, a full registration list after we host our events. So we make sure to um, download that, get that uploaded into our CRM, or if there is already a direct integration, making sure that that's synced. Um, and then taking a look at who attended, who didn't attend, um, if they did attend and they, you know, were already a prospect or a customer, is there an opportunity there? So working really closely with our sales team and enabling them to understand what the content in the context of the event was so that they're able to communicate with their customer, like as soon as they can, while it's still top of mind to hopefully convert into at least a conversation. Um, so that's one thing that we do, um, so our team works super closely with with the sales team. Like really, what we're doing, like our, the marketing team's goals, is to enable sales to um, to boost their relationships with our customers and prospects. Right. So that's one big piece of it. Um, and then we talked about like following up. So like I mentioned, always we always send a follow up email. You know, thanking people for being there. We we share a recording to everyone who registered, not just those who attended. Um, if we you know, had a presentation that we were sharing live during the event, we usually share it with them like in the chat at the very end, just to hold their attention through the end. Um, and then we also include that in the follow-up email. Envision has like, a ton of different resources, um, like learning, learning and education. Uh, so we have like books and eBooks and handbooks. Um, and I already mentioned our blog. So we'll share any resources that were relevant to the topics just to also get them back on our website and engaging maybe again with the drift bot. So it's just kind of like this like full cycle of uh, post event engagement. And sorry, one, one other additional thing that mm -hmm. I keep thinking about, hopefully it's not too much of a curveball for you. Um, you know, with your distributed workforce, yeah, uh, you, you, you're going through all of these events constantly. How are you uh, reporting to the different departments? And are, do you have a, a dashboard that you send out af right after? Or how are you doing this internally? Yeah, so we use Slack um, and we have kind of different channels. Um, I'm like, I'm not gonna give too much away, but no, yeah. we have uh, we have like a, a field marketing channel that I kind of use for all of our programs for like wide visibility. Um, and our, our sales team has like a global channel. So we, we work with them there to uh, promote our events so that they can you know promote them to their customers directly. Um, through enablement, we have a newsletter that we send out. It's it's so funny because we have like marketing to our sales team, and we have like marketing to our our customers and prospects. It's like a twofold. Yeah. <laughs> it's a dual role. Yeah, it's definitely a dual role. Yeah, but there's uh, also a lot of one on one. You know, if I notice like a really like awesome logo and you know an upsell coming, I'll just reach out to that person directly and be like, hey, like. I'm flagging this for you and like, this is a really great opportunity. Let me know if you have any questions and how I can support. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I really, I really appreciate it. I know Aaron, you have uh, something that you want to share with everybody, but uh, Lisa, you know, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thank you. This is fun. Yeah. So I'm having a little bit of trouble accessing the chat. So Chris, I'm not sure if you're able to drop in the link for folks. Regardless, you'll be followed up with via email with a link to this campaign planning bundle, but really the idea is to give you the framework, um, timelines, to-dos, everything you need to be successful using what Lisa's gone through today. Um, so we will get that all to everybody ASAP. Um, and I wanna just take a little bit of time to talk through the poll results and open the floor for questions. So feel free to uh, shoot any of your questions in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but as for polls, we asked a few questions to the audience and I was very curious as a demand gen marketer myself, where do people wish that they could invest more time when approaching a campaign? And it looks like it's tied with content creation and lead nurture, which are definitely my top two areas of focus. Um, Lisa, I'm curious how you feel. Are you in the content creation side of things? Do you wish you could devote more to event strategy, the analysis and reporting? Um, where is it for you? Yeah, obviously my main focus is like events and webinars because that's that's my team. Mm -hmm. um, but we definitely, it's a mix of, it's a mix of all of these things. I say we get a lot of our volume actually from um, like our chat bot on our website and people mm -hmm. that are reaching out explicitly about like being in touch with someone. Uh, I, we see probably our, our fastest conversions there. Okay, mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that was gonna be my second uh, question was which tactic is driving the highest quality leads or converting the highest? Um, so no one answered chat bot, but I've heard that that's 
one tactic that needs to really be explored more. It's like most people have the chatbot. It's more of a passive channel on the website. Yeah. But I think that there's a major opportunity for people to get a lot more strategic about how they're leveraging that. So. Yeah. And I'd say driving like attendees to events um, specifically, email mm-hmm. nurture is really, really smart. Um, so we like we have a ton of content. So if they, someone downloads a piece of content, they get an email and then we might just throw in like a little ad spot promoting an upcoming event. And we we've seen, especially with like top of funnel events, that that is like a super impactful way to to reach these folks. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, we talked about challenges when launching a new campaign. And this was really across the board. It was, you know, from targeting to proving ROI, budget constraints, buy-in from sales. I think it just goes to show the challenge that we as event marketers, demand gen marketers are facing and being pulled in so many different directions when approaching a campaign. Um, So that's where it is important, like you said, Lisa, to really just trust your gut. Um, I think if you have strong data, you trust your gut and you have good content, those three things combined you're set up for success. Yep. Completely agree. So I wanted to just address a couple questions that we got ahead of time to the audience. Um, So this is specific to cross-functional buy-in when you're, when you're first mapping out a campaign. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I'm curious, how do you recruit members across the team to really get excited to help push forward the objectives, to deliver on time. Um, if you have any tips for the team, I'd love to know. Just so it's not all the heavy lifting on the marketing side of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that's a, a really good question. And it's it's a challenge and it kind of comes back to like psychology, right? <laughs> so like if you are wanting buy-in from your teammates, they, they want something in return. So what are you offering to those those people? So let's say, you know, you want someone from the sales team to moderate a a panel discussion, a customer panel discussion. I would approach them with, why is this important to you? How can you use this maybe for your own programming in the future? Um, This is gonna strengthen a relationship and possibly create like an upsell opportunity or lock in a deal that's been tough. Um, So really thinking about like how, what you're doing impacts the other party. Um, and when I'm working with on the product side, which can sometimes candidly be more challenging because people in product are working on product and they're shipping product mm-hmm. and events are just like a kind of an extracurricular if they have time. Um, so but I'm like, this is your product we're showcasing. Like we're getting people to understand all of the hard work that you're doing and getting people to adopt it and, and use all these features that you've been rolling out. So you can, it, again, it just comes back to human psychology and making people understand what the benefit is for them. Absolutely. And, and I'm curious as well with your transition to virtual events and being a, a software product, have you seen that uh, a positive uptick in conversion or signups in the platform after the event? Cause you're really giving more of an opportunity to push people right into that versus, you know, in person where there's a bit more, friction from that handshake to them actually getting into the product. Yeah, definitely, definitely faster conversion. And it's all about obviously like the sales team knowing um, what's going on and being really dialed into our programs um, and and us being responsible for making sure that they they have that information so that they can spot opportunities. Um, uh, like many large uh, tech organizations, we have a lot of automations built into our CRM. So based on a number of um, algorithms and data points based on like title and all those targeting pieces I mentioned earlier and and how they qualify. Um, So we've definitely had a lot of learnings over the last year, um, but conversions are happening faster. Yes, is the short answer. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all that we've got for questions. Chris, I don't know if you had any that you wanted to, to close out with. No, no, Lisa, again, this was amazing. And uh, I really appreciate you always your willingness to always come on and share your knowledge and what you're learning. Um, I'm sure what you've gone through over the past year is, you know, an NBA and in in marketing and events and all of that. So uh, definitely appreciate it. I'm excited to share the details from this interview uh, after the fact over the next few days. Um, and I really hope for those that uh, did attend, if you have any questions, feel free to email us and um, we're excited for uh, more of these. And we continue to learn more and more and it helps us build a better platform and 
Lisa, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I know you're really busy. <laughs> Absolutely. This is fun. I always love working with you guys. <laughs> Thanks, All right. Lisa. Have a good one. All right. We'll be in touch with the recording and the asset for everybody. Cool. We're good. Lisa, thank you.